Welcome to Making a Murder Rubber Ducky YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us for our daily ma'am reading. We are digging into the Casio investigative reports. We're doing pages 41 through 50 today, and this will be part 5. And if you want to follow along with us, you can absolutely do so at rubberduckystephenaveryfiles.com. And there you will choose your documents library, and then you can go ahead and choose Casio file or tile. And you will see the Casio investigative reports there. Click that open and go ahead and go to, par, uh, what was it, page 41. Thank you, and let's get started. Page 41. Type of activity, flyover utilizing lakeshore aviation. Date of activity, 110405. Reporting officer, Sheriff Jerry Pagel. On Friday, 11.04.05, Investigator Wendy Baldwin and I went to Lakeshore Aviation in Manitowoc, where we met with Pilot Kurt Drum. We did a flyover of the Zipper property and the Avery's Auto Salvage, attempting to locate Teresa Hobock's vehicle. Upon flying over Avery's Auto Salvage, we noted there were thousands of vehicles in the salvage yard, and we specifically were unable to locate any vehicle similar to that which was being driven by Teresa Hobock. Upon flying over the zipper property, we also met with negative results. We did a flyover of the entire Mishka area and again met with negative results. We also flew to Brown County from Mishka in an attempt to possibly locate Teresa Halbach's vehicle, again meeting with negative results. We finally flew from Teresa Halbach's residence, located on County Highway B, west of St. John, to the Mishka area via U.S. Highway 10. And again, we were unable to locate the Halbach vehicle. Sheriff Jerry Pagel, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 42. Type of activity follow-up investigation. Date of activity 110405. Reporting Officer Sheriff Jerry Pagel. On Friday, 11.04.05, I had personal contact with Sue Lisso and Joan Leckler at the m &I Bank in Chilton. A subpoena for records pertaining to the financial transactions for Teresa Halbach were provided to Lisso and Leckler. I was informed that Teresa had a personal checking and savings account at the m &I Bank and, w and also a checking account for her business, which was known as Photography by Teresa. A check of the financial records revealed no recent activity, specifically no activity since Monday, 10.31.05. Records pertaining to Teresa Halbach's financial accounts at the M&I Bank can be found incorporated with this report. Sheriff Jerry Pagel, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 43. Type of activity, contact with Singular Wireless. Date of activity, 11.04.05. Reporting Officer, Investigator John Dietering. Documents generated, none. On Friday, 11.04.05 at 13.10 hours, I, Dietering, did have contact with the representative of Singular Wireless regarding a court order that was prepared by Investigator Baldwin and facsimile transmitted to Singular Wireless. Singular Wireless folks advised me that they required an eavesdropping warrant similar to a Title III wiretap warrant. In order to access any voicemail records, John Dietering, Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 44. Type of activity, interview of Bradley Sheck, date of activity 11.04.05, reporting officer, investigator John Dietering. Documents generated, none. On Friday, 11.04.05, at 14.09 hours, investigator Weger and I did interview the following individual concerning this matter, Bradley C. Sheck. Information had been developed that Bradley Sheck was, had been involved in a physical relationship with Teresa Halbach. Information developed that Mr. Sheck had possibly been calling Teresa Halbach after the relationship had terminated. Prior to asking Mr. Sheck any questions, he was advised that he was free to leave, not under any arrest, and could stop answering questions at any time he chose. He indicated he understood this and agreed to speak with us. 
Shaq indicated he is currently employed as an executive producer for CBS News. He states he reports for work at 0130 hours daily. He went on to indicate Teresa Halbach is one of his best friends. He stated that their friendship goes in spurts and she has worked on weddings as a photographer for the bride and groom and that Bradley had provided DJ service for the wedding. He states that they have been friends approximately two years. Bradley indicated that he and his ex-wife, who is identified as Casey Croning, had posed for nude photographs and Teresa had taken these photographs at Pierce Studios in Green Bay. He stated they had become comfortable with Teresa and that they both agreed to pose for these photographs. The photographs appear uh, the photographs appear to be very tastefully done. He stated that he had been divorced since August of 2005 and that he had been separated for some time previous to that. I was able to determine that Casey M. Sheck and Bradley C. Sheck filed for divorce in Brown County on 10-26-04. Bradley freely admitted to being involved in a sexual relationship with Teresa, but says they are not romantically involved. Page 45. He stated he had seen Teresa at Max and Irma's at Bay Park Square approximately two weeks ago and that they had had lunch together. He stated that he had text messaged Teresa at 12.45 hours on 10.31.05 and he had gotten no response. He stated he called her at twelve he called her at twenty one seventeen hours on eleven oh three oh five and he found her voicemail to be full. He stated that after a couple rings the phone transferred to an automated voicemail, not Teresa's personal greeting. He stated that he, Nicole Sanger, and Teresa did a lot of three way calls. He stated that Nicole's phone number is nine two zero four seven five one three five one. Bradley indicated that Teresa was not known to be depressed or have any problems. He stated that in his last conversation with Teresa, she had made no mention of any incidences during auto trader shoots. He went on to indicate he and Teresa were involved in a sexual relationship a long time ago. He stated that Teresa advised him that she had nothing going on in that department during her recent conversation with him. Bradley did indicate that Teresa mentioned to him that she had slept with her roommate Scott several times and that she had regretted it, but had gotten over the awkwardness of being involved with him. Bradley indicated that the relationship with Teresa started at the beginning of 2005. He had no answer as to why the relationship was not pursued other than they were both busy. Bradley Sheck did indicate that he owns vacant property of State Highway 57 north of Greenleaf, but indicated that this was just a lot. We asked Bradley to provide us with his activities for Monday, 10.31.05. He indicated to the best of his recollection, he went into work at approximately 01.45 hours and was there until approximately 10 o'clock a.m. or so. He believed he slept during the day and was not sure was not very sure of anything else he did. He stated he got a voicemail message at about 1400 hours and at that time got up, did a couple of chores, and went back to bed shortly thereafter. He allowed us to review his cellular phone and there were missed calls at 5.55 p.m., 7.53 p.m., and 7.54 p.m. He then indicated he had that he recalled going to Unison Credit Union after work on Monday and then met his father at the Pontiac dealer in Kukana, I believe this to be Gustman, and paid his father $1,500 that he owed him. Mr. Sheck had nothing further to offer in this interview and indicated he would be more than willing to allow us to interview him if we had any further questions. The interview terminated at 1430 hours, John Dietering Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 46. Type of activity attempted contact at 215 South Quincy, number 3, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Type of activity 110405. Reporting Officer Investigator John Dietering. Document generated none. On Friday, 110405 at 1450 hours, Investigator Weger and I Dietering did attempt to make contact at 215 South Quincy Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin, apartment 3.
SBC Security had advised us that while they could not provide us a last name subscriber for 920-435-1367, they could in fact provide us with a last address that the number listed to. Investigator Weger and I initially found no one at the residence. Investigation continues. John Dietering, Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 47. Type of activity. Telephone interview with Nicole L. Sanger. Date of activity 110405. Reporting officer. Investigator John Dietering. Documents generated none. On Friday 110405 at 1505 hours, I Dietering did do a telephone interview with the following individual, Nicole S. Sanger. Nicole indicated she had last seen Teresa two weeks ago last Sunday. She stated at this time Teresa seemed to be in a really good mood and they were going to do lunch with Bradley Sheck. However, Nicole had other things to do and was unable to attend. She stated Teresa and Bradley and she had a three-way call at that time. I asked Nicole who Teresa was close to. She stated Teresa was very close to her family, to Bradley Sheck, and to her roommate. Nicole indicated she has known Teresa for Four, between 12 and 18 months. Nicole indicated that to her knowledge, Teresa was not involved with anyone as of a couple months ago. She described Bradley and Teresa as good friends and had no knowledge of any other involvement. I asked Nicole for some of the other names of people that she knew are friends of Teresa. She stated that she is a very bad with names and was unable to provide me with any other information concerning Teresa's friends. I've terminated the conversation with Ms. Singer at approximately 15-20 hours. Investigation continues. John Dietering, Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 48. Type of Activity Contact with Michael Joseph Vanden Heuvel. Date of activity 110405. Reporting Officer Investigator John Dietering. Documents generated none. On 110504 at 1525 hours, Investigator Weger and I Dietering did make contact with the following individual at his residence, Michael Joseph Vanden Heuvel. It should be noted that Investigator Weger had contacted Mr. Vanden Heuvel by phone and Mr. Vanden Heuvel did agree to meet us at his residence. Vanden Heuvel indicated that he had not had a home phone number since he was in a homeless shelter in May of 2004. He indicated that at this time he could not recall his home telephone number. He did not believe that he had ever had a phone number that began with the prefix of 475. It should be noted that I subsequently received a phone call from Mr. Vanden Heuvel after we left his residence indicating that his last landline phone number was 920-360-5551. Vanden Heuvel indicated he did not know Teresa Halbach at all. He indicated he had not he had no facts at his residence. He states he does not have the internet service but does have a home computer. He indicated to the best of his recollection he was home alone on ten thirty one oh five all day. Vanden Heuvel allowed Investigator Weger and I to do a cursory search of his apartment, and nothing of interest was observed at this time. We terminated our interview with Mr. Vanden Heuvel at approximately 15.30 hours. Investigation continues. John Dietering, Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 49. Type of Activity, Interview of Thomas E. Pierce. Date of Activity, 11.04.05. Reporting Officer, Investigator John Dietering. Documents generated none. On Friday, 110405, at 1558 hours, Investigator Weger and I did interview the following individual regarding this matter. Thomas E. Pierce. The interview took place at his place of business, Pierce Photography, located at 1599 Western Avenue, Green Bay, Wisconsin, 920-592-9494. Pierce indicated that Teresa Halbach and he have known one another four to five years in total. He indicated Teresa interned at his studio during her last year of school at UW Green Bay. He stated that once Teresa graduated, she stayed on first as a payroll employee of his, and then he and Teresa actually set up two separate businesses under one roof. He stated this has gone on 
almost two years. He stated Teresa is a very helpful and responsible individual and stated that the business arrangement is that they will take care of each other's appointments and bookings, etc. He stated that he has never discussed how well Teresa is doing financially because he believes it is none of his concern. He stated they became good friends as well as co-workers. He indicated that he was not aware of Teresa's dating anyone. He stated Teresa would perhaps go to the movies with individuals, but he is not sure of whom. He stated that she does have three or four male friends who are motorcycle racers, and she would on occasion accompany them to Road America to watch motorcycle racing there. He stated that he believed if Teresa was only seeing one person in particular, Thomas would know about that, about it. Pierce indicated that invariably Teresa would notify him if she would be gone for an extended period. He did indicate that her employment with Auto Trader had been taking up quite a bit of her time. Page 50. He stated that the photo studio is closed on Mondays and he did not believe that Teresa had any bookings on Tuesday. Teresa did mention to him that she would see him on Tuesday, 11.01.05. He stated that Teresa had made plans to attend a business marketing meeting on Wednesday, 11.02.05, and indicated that she would be in between 11 a.m. and 12 o'clock noon on Wednesday. He stated that when she did not appear at the studio or go to the business marketing meeting on Wednesday, he became concerned for her. He stated when Teresa did not appear at the studio on Thursday, 11.03.05, he became extremely concerned, and after lunch, he became really worried. He stated he called Teresa's cellular phone and learned that her mailbox was full. He stated that this was extremely concerning to him, as she invariably will check her messages numerous times throughout the course of the day. Thomas indicated that he then called Teresa's mom, Karen, who indicated she would begin calling Teresa's friends in an attempt to locate her. Pierce indicated he does not have a fax machine on his premises. He indicated Teresa was provided with a fax machine by Auto Trader. He stated Teresa would fax in the amount of work or contacts she had in a course of a business day to Auto Trader, and she would be paid according to the contacts from the fax. Pierce went on to indicate that recently Teresa had been receiving a lot of telephone calls that she would not answer. Thomas indicated that these phone calls would have no message and apparently were coming from a phone number she did not recognize. Pierce indicated that Teresa told him that someone keeps calling and not leaving a message. Teresa stated, I won't call them back. Thomas indicated that it appeared as though Teresa did not know who was calling. He stated that this began in early to mid-summer. There was a break in the routine and then approximately three weeks ago this started again. Thomas believed that the phone calls were always originating from the same number. Thomas indicated if Teresa was upset by these calls, she didn't let on that it did upset her. Thomas indicated that she had told him that she had had a problem during the time she was working for Auto Trader. He stated that she had told him she had gone to photograph a car and the individual who owned the vehicle invited her in and made some verbal comments, which he found made her uncomfortable, and at this point, she left. Thomas indicated he did not know whether Teresa would give out cards to auto trader clients with her cellular phone number listed on it. He stated that she would get calls from the auto trader who weren't necessarily satisfied with the auto trader's performance. Thomas indicated that she would usually tell the clients not to call her, but to call the auto trader about this. All right, guys, that concludes our daily read of the ma'am, our daily ma'am read, I should say, and we've completed part five. We'll have part six tomorrow. I did want to go over a few things just to touch some base of what we've kind of read through. So on page 43 here, um, let's see if I can grab a little bit of that. You notice that it says singular wireless folks advise me that they required an eavesdropping warrant. Let's go ahead and underline that. Similar to a Title III wiretap warrant. Um, this is, I think this is going to come into play a little bit if I remember right. And this, this delays things quite a bit. So I wanted to make a, a special note of that so that we see that it does require an eavesdropping warrant. So you guys, um, the next page is 44 that I want to talk about. And um, it's with the interview of Bradley Sheck. So he doesn't really have an alibi. He um, 
let's just start at the beginning on Bradley for real. He works for CBS News. I mean, and he works at night, so he's available during the day. Interesting. Um, let's see, we'll make a little, see where it says that? Let's see if I can control the mouse. Ugh, I'm horrible at it. Sorry, guys. I'm not an artist here. We'll try. <laughs> we'll try to do better. Um, but that's interesting. And then also, it states that um, he took, look at this right here, you guys. Bradley indicated that he and his ex-wife, who was identified as Casey Croning. Now, Casey and him actually... He, she files a restraining order on Bradley back in 2004. And this is after the pictures are taken. Him and Teresa are seeing each other. And Casey, his wife, files a restraining order. And five days later, she files for divorce. Now, what's interesting is there's some court case in here that we're going to have to look more up on that has to do with these naked pictures. And Teresa went to the court case with Casey and Bradley. All right, so then, more interesting is the fact that on October 28, 2005, his divorce is final, which is, let's see, 28, 29, 30, 31, three days, three days before Teresa, oops, I have a kitty, um, before Teresa goes missing. So I just wanted to share that with you, um, and then let's jump to the next thing. So, I want to talk about page 45. Um, this is where we have this section right here. So, he is actually calling her at 1245, or he's messenger, sorry. He stated that he had text messaged Teresa at 1245 on 103105 and he had gotten no response. So, on the day that Teresa disappears, Bradley Sheck is still texting her. He also stated that he called her at 2117 hours on 11305, found her voicemail full. Okay, so he's staying in close contact with her. And he knows what her personal greeting should sound like, so it sounds like he calls quite often. Then, when you go down here, it states this little gem that just is like, what? Okay, you guys. We'll start right in here. Let me get this. Okay. He states that Teresa advised him that she had nothing going on in that department. Look at this sexual relationship a long time ago. Not even a full year ago is a long time ago. No. But watch this. He indicated Teresa mentioned to him that she had slept with her roommate Scott several times and had regretted it, but had gotten over the awkwardness of being involved with him. So, she's still with the roommate that she has slept with. She has Brian Hilligus coming to the home, who was her ex-boyfriend. She's seen a married man who now has a, filed a, restraining, has a restraining order filed against him that, that in five days later proceeds to a divorce. Wow, you guys. Wow. Um, let's see if there was anything else on here that I wanted to talk about. Not really, other than, you know, we'll point this out that um, he has no alibi. He, I mean, he has a shaky alibi at best, I should say. He allowed us to review his cellular phone. There were missed calls between 5.55 and 7.53 p.m. and 7.54 p.m. This is, this is not good because we're looking at, what, a two-hour stretch that he has no time he can account for and he didn't even take his calls. He then indicated he recalled going to Unison Credit Unit after work on Monday. But remember, he got off work on Monday in like 10 a.m. So that still frees up a lot of his day. And then he met his father at the Pontiac dealer in Kiwani and gave him money that he owed him. But it never states what time. So he could have been done with all this by noon and been back to his home 
and he has no alibi. So then let's go ahead and look at page 47, the telephone interview with Nicole uh, Singer. I found this statement very, very interesting. I'm not quite sure why they would have said it this way, but this is what they said. Uh, my son got a kitten, two of them, and they're crawling all over the desktop. Okay, you guys. So here's here's the problem I'm seeing. Nicole indicates that she had seen had last seen Teresa two weeks ago, last Sunday. She stated that at this time, Teresa seemed to be in a really good mood. They were going to do lunch with Bradley Sheck. However, Nicole had other things to do and was unable to attend. So how did she see her? She stated Teresa and Bradley, and she had a three-way call at that time. So she didn't see her. She talked with her. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. And then, I think it's interesting that Nicole has no idea um, of the involvement with Bradley, if they're good friends. So, and then, <laughs> this part kind of kills me. She, she can't remember any of the names of the friends because she has a bad memory. She's bad with names. She can't even remember her first name of any friend. Huh. All right. And then on page 49, we're interviewing Thomas E. Pierce again, John Dietering. And do you notice, let me grab this real quick. This part right, right here, this paragraph, he indicated that he was not aware of Teresa dating anyone, but he brings up four male friends who are motorcycle racers. So he doesn't three or four. He doesn't say that she has three or four male friends and one is that they all are and um, that she goes to Road America to watch motorcycle racing there. I find that very interesting. And on page 50, um, the last page, I thought it was very concerning about these calls and notice that he, he actually talks about a timeline where there's a break taken. So I wanted to review that because I think that's important. Pierce went on to indicate that recently Teresa had been receiving a lot of phone calls that she would not answer. So she would get these phone calls, she wouldn't answer them, and she stated, I won't call them back. Now, he stated that this began in early to mid-summer, then there was a break in this routine, and then approximately three weeks ago, this started up again. So I don't know who that call is. Um, why don't we have that call unidentified maybe or identified on our phone record if we know from this statement that it happened in early to midsummer where are her early to midsummer phone bills so all right you guys I want to thank you so much for joining me on this and let's go ahead and um, wrap up for the day thank you so much for joining me today on the RD making a murder made daily ma'am reading um, and we completed part five. I look forward to doing part six with you tomorrow. Also, if you want to follow along with us, of course, you can do the rubber ducky Stephen Avery files dot com library. And we did recently add um, a new wing there, a new section that includes a daily ma'am series. And that's not our big surprise. We still are adding the players that would be the Denny suspects and those individuals that are involved in the case. So that will be coming up soon. And that's a huge addition. As well as if you care to follow us on Twitter, we invite you to do so and we look forward to it. If you are wanting to have a little chit chat with us and follow us after live videos, you can follow in the description below the video, the puddle chat, just take a little click and you will be able to download Discord and jump right into chat. There's, It's extremely user friendly and we do have 24-7 chat going around the clock on that channel. And uh, I want to thank each of you from the bottom of my heart for subscribing. And if you would like to do an update, you just hit that bell and that will give you a little ding when we release a video. And I just want to say every day we work towards, um, you know, getting justice for those that are wrongfully convicted. And both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are both 100% innocent. And if you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. Thank you guys and have a wonderful day.